So, uh, welcome. My name is Raf. I will be the moderator for this interesting and eclectic group of panelists, uh, all hand selected. So it's my fault if they're boring. Uh, but we're going to do a little bit, uh, uh, an interesting way of doing panels. Uh, usually a panel is somebody asks a question and we all, and they all take turns yapping on for a minute or two and it, it's kind of boring. So I thought we'd do something slightly differently. The, to the, the topic is the cloud is not secure, how to convince IT to buy into buying cloud services. Uh, so along those topic lines, right along that line, uh, how many of you guys here are actually in investigating, thinking about cloud services? Curious? Okay, cool. So you all will be asking the questions here, all right? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna split the group down the middle here between Bill and David, and uh, one side will basically are, uh, provide the for argument, the other side will provide the against, and, it, and hilarity will ensue. <laughs> so I'm gonna right. let the guys introduce themselves. Go ahead, we'll start with you, Adam. Uh, so I'm Adam Ely, oh, I'm the Gary founder Fox. and uh, CEO of uh, Blue Box Security, a mobile security company with a cloud offering. Uh, prior to that, I was a CISO of Heroku, uh, Division of Salesforce, TiVo before that, and I was at Disney before that. I'm David Mortman. I've already forgotten if I'm the pro or the con side of things, but uh, I'm the uh, chief security architect in Stratus. We're a cloud management company, and before that, I ran security and operations for C3, and before that, I was CISO at Siebel Systems. I'm Bill Burns, director of networking and IT security at Netflix. Um, obviously, I'm going to be on the pro cloud side since we're one of the biggest Amazon customers. That's what you think. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's right. We haven't practiced that part. Um, previously, I was a security architect at AOL and Netscape. I'm Derek Winkworth. I work at Juniper Networks. I'm product manager of Juno's Manageability, which is the greatest title because it's nice and vague. But uh, I actually work on orchestration, uh, integrating Juniper systems with orchestration tools that are, for instance, frequently used in cloud systems. Cool, uh, and I'm Raph Lowe, I'm with HP. I'm a, a now a security strategist with the uh, software group. Um, prior to this, I did some, uh, spent some time in a small company you may have heard of called General Electric, doing security architecture and, and uh, business uh, analytics type stuff. And so, all right, first question, who wants to, who wants to give us the, the first topic question? And show of hands. Oh, this is gonna suck, come on you guys. Go ahead, the brave one. Okay, cool. So we have a pushing, uh, uh, getting into cloud uh, from the business or IT side. I'm going to give you guys the business side and you guys get the IT side. Uh, so uh, Bill and Derek, you guys want to go ahead and... Chances help. are the business is already there, so IT needs to catch up, quite honestly. Um, the job of IT should be to enable those services and to get out of the way, find the safest path for people to use and consume cloud services. Um, if you try to restrict it too much, they'll still go around you anyhow, and then you'll be irrelevant. So you need to be, you need to figure out a way to foster the use of cloud services at your company, the one, one that works for you. Um, uh, if you try to restrict it too much, th that won't work. So chances are you already have company or business units using cloud services in your company right now. And Ed? Uh, no, that uh, just in general, um, the whole purpose of IT is to facilitate business. So, I mean, IT should not, what he said, it should not be an obstacle. If it's cloud or if it's anything else, you should be figuring out how to do things, not uh, just saying no. How about from the IT perspective, gentlemen? As they defer to each other, this is, <laughs> didn't see that coming. Well, you can tell that we're both bad at IT then because IT people never agree on anything. <laughs> But um, I mean, the, the, the thing is, I mean, honestly, I, I think the business is where it's going to actually go. And IT, you know, if anything, you need to go to IT with the approach of, look, you can, you can be part of the problem or you can get run over by the business. So uh, you may as well figure out uh, what needs doing and, and, you know, be the one going to the business to help make the business case for it rather than just getting ignored completely. Yeah, so I would, I would generally agree with everything that's been said. And then what I would also add to that is from the IT side, um, IT has a responsibility to the stability of the organization, the overall IT operations, let's include security operations. They're the ones that are going to get hammered if something goes wrong, if something's not working. So there is a balance of giving the users what they need, making things productive, but they also need to plan uh, and make sure that, that this is actually what's going to work long term for the organization and it's supportable. But at the end of the day, 
and the business is uh, usually ahead of IT, so we have to catch up if we're behind. All right, next question. In the back. Good Lord, did you guys hear that, the question? Okay. Yeah. Basically, you bought a bunch of crap over the years, and now you want to do something else. Why? <laughs> um, did I summarize that all right? <laughs> so uh, huh, where do I start? All right, Bill, you look like you're writing there furiously. Go ahead. Give us uh, an answer. I was writing so that I had notes when the first person talked, I would have time to put my thoughts together. So a few thoughts that come down. to mind is, so this is part of the consumerization of IT and business services. Um, you can buy an iPad today, and in six months or 18 months, it'll be obsolete. So I think that's an easy argument to talk to the business folks and say, look, technology is innovating and evolving so fast that the stuff that we buy today won't have the capacity, won't have the capabilities, won't have the features that we need a year from now, two years from now. And so we're seeing that, that time lens, sort of that, that time frame compress. And so I think it's pretty straightforward to go to the business team and say, we need to start adopting um, cloud services or, or cloud applications or other services that are, that are services-based as opposed to infrastructure-based because um, this, is the, this is the trend. This is the future. And if you start investing in these uh, sort of you know, small, less risky bits, uh, bets now, then you can start using those services going forward and rely, rely less on expensive CapEx infrastructure. So this is a way to start getting onto the innovation curve um, by trying out a, a few services now. Okay. David? And actually, in a similar vein, I mean, the whole cloud is, to put it in incredibly broad strokes, essentially the next generation of outsourcing and rental. I mean, that's what you're doing. I mean, you, most companies today, or have been spending decades renting gear. You know, they rent switches, they rent servers, and this is just the next generation of that, only it's even more cost effective, it's, and it's even faster to do, it's faster to provision and deprovision. So all you're doing is following the natural trend of things to go. I don't think there's a face-saving gesture so much as saying, look how I'm saving you even more money. That makes the assumption that you're saving them money at all, <laughs> but... Well, that more, saving money would in fact be saving more than you currently were if you're not saving any. Okay, Adam, you got anything to add to that? Sure, uh, I'll add to that. That you know, we've seen this, uh, we've seen this trend um, in cloud for a very long time. We just didn't call it cloud. I worked for a company before Disney that we were a SaaS provider, but at the time it was called ASP, Application Solution Provider. Then that was bad for some reason. We're outsourced, and that was bad. So they were hosted solution provider. Now they're a SaaS company. Um, we've seen all of this before, <clears throat> and in any industry, when people go outside, they're going outside to solve a problem. So I would just take it back to the business, back to IT, back to internal development and say, what's the problem that got us here and got us to look at the cloud solutions, that got us to look at somebody else? Why can't we solve that in-house? Is it cost, is it time, whatever? And I would drive it down to that core and to the ROI and say, is it a better investment to go with these? Because a lot of the cloud services, be it infrastructure, <coughs> platform, or SaaS, you get economies of scale in development, security, and operations because they have to do that for 5,000, 10,000, 100,000 customers. And so I just drive it back down to kind of that, um, the actual just business case. And if it nets out, then you go with it. And if not, you build it in-house, whatever's right. Yeah, you can get the last word, sir. Uh, I think, actually, it's funny. It's, I think the devil is in the details here. It depends how far removed you are. But like, where, where are you, if there's a scale of one to 10, and one being that you're actually ready to go to the cloud, and 10 being you're in some kind of cloud unicorn land where everything's awesome. Um, and you're, Are there rainbows? There's rainbows and, and unicorn poop and it's, oh, everything boy. is great, way over there. Um, you know, it's not like you just pick up one day and put everything in the cloud. You have to, this is like a full stack evaluation. Are your applications ready? You know, um, 
what services are, are actually best for you for deploying the, um, the things that you need. Do you need IAS? Do you just need software as a service? Um, so there, there's a lot of things to evaluate there. I would, the second point I'd make is um, if they're saying that now, like, well, I'm protecting what I'm protecting, the natural evolution of, of people who are more towards one or two right now is that they're going to start developing a DevOps practice around uh, further and further integration of all of their IT systems um, using automation tools like Puppet or Chef or OpenStack, which are cloud-like tools. So the, things are moving in that direction anyway. It, if, if they're not already thinking about that and thinking about what things they want to put in the cloud and what things they want to keep locally, then, um, then something's wrong. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I heard something interesting, so I'm going to ask a question on behalf of you guys. Because I heard David say something that's interesting, and he's, uh, you guys started talking about cost savings. So here's a question to, to the four of you, all right? Does, the cloud, does moving to the cloud actually save us money? Because we've seen all the articles and, and the CIO type of material that you guys have probably seen. How many of you guys have seen the go to cloud, save money, right? So does, does actually, Bill, I think your best position to, to answer that question, does going to the cloud actually save money? I think what we do is we measure in terms of efficiency or productivity. So to Adam's point, let's say the business has a problem of they want a collaboration platform. If they went to IT and said, we need a collaboration platform, they would say, great, we're going to build one, or maybe we're going to buy one, we're going to buy a bunch of gear, we'll put it in our data center. Six to eight weeks later, maybe four weeks if you're really efficient, you might have the first version of a system running, as opposed to hey, let me go on the web and find a bunch of services from SaaS providers and try out a few. Like, you can break out your credit card. Sometimes they have freemium models. So in almost no time, you can start piloting, you know, piloting a collaboration platform and spend almost no money or maybe a little bit of money. And the, the goal here is try out an idea, see what works, what doesn't work, throw it away, iterate, try again. Hmm. So in terms of if, if you're focused on saving money for, for you know, a new service, for instance, that's probably the wrong metric. It's more about enabling the business faster. Adam, anything to add? No, I, mean, I generally agree with that. I mean, I've seen cases where moving to the cloud didn't make uh, sense. It cost more, didn't net you any uh, uh, increased productivity. And I've seen cases where, just as Bill said, you can get it faster, and, and that makes your customers happy, it makes you more revenue, and it's great. Derek? Um, I, have known, I think you guys encapsulated that pretty well. Last word? Uh, well, at a, at a previous company, we were, we were running on Amazon, and the bills were getting extraordinarily high. I mean, we're talking over $100,000 a month. And the company said, whoa, we're, gonna, we're spending $1.5 million a year on AWS. We really need to roll this into a COA provider and build all of our own hardware. And I said, OK. So we went and actually and figured out, how, do we, how would we build an equivalent infrastructure to what we had on that date? And the rough cost would have been about $8 million. So that was a cost. This, I mean, it was it, just from a pure capex perspective. Yeah. It was just. I mean, it was a no-brainer. Now, could, we could have done cheaper. We could probably go down for even two two million dollars, or probably even equivalent. But then there would be additional headcount to manage the gear. There would be more downtime. The ability to respond quickly to provision new services would be a lot slower. So even if the even if you could save money on the hardware, you're not going to actually get the savings in the on the capital expense on the non-capital expenses. Good enough. So Derek mentioned something I, I wanted to touch on, which was you know taking an equivalent service and moving it to the cloud. So one of the one of the lessons learned from Netflix was, you know, we took www.netflix.com, took it from our data center, stuck it in Amazon's cloud, and it performed horribly. It was it was not designed for that cloud environment, and so we actually spent a lot of time going back and re-architecting the entire system to to be more service oriented and then each component was more resilient rather than relying on you know a bunch of, of at the time we had you know sort of an old architecture it worked fine then but we couldn't just take it to the cloud to, to Amazon's cloud and the infrastructure infrastructure as a service so um, don't think that you can take your whatever application in your data center and just move it to the cloud and suddenly get you know cost savings or it works better or it scales better there's a lot of work you have to do um, either by building or re-architecting your system or, or putting it on another platform that's uh, more of a platform as a service. But there's a, there's a lot of efficiencies to be gained, but it's not for free. You just can't take your, your product and stick it in the cloud and, and win. Okay. Next question from the audience. Right here.
So that's an interesting question. Death by a thousand paper cuts, because you're going from CapEx, which is traditionally, it's difficult to pry money out of a CFO's cold dead hands, right? Let's face it. Um, but it, it, if you've got a credit card, and you can just sort of go bill 10 bucks at a time, 1,000 bucks at a time, it's a lot easier. What do you guys think? Uh, I'm going to start with Adam. Um, yes. <laughs> so efficient in his eloquence. Yeah, I'm not going to say. Um, I mean, yeah, that's part of the problem, uh, or I shouldn't say one of the, part of the problem. Part of, uh, one of the potential downsides of the consumerization of IT is that now it's accessible to everybody, and you do have to relook at your processes and how you manage that spending and how you control those things. Um, you know, I've seen companies where they've had a lot of problem with this, but they've simply just uh, reevaluated their expense process and that fixed it. When they wouldn't uh, reimburse somebody $1,500 a month for their team's you know, CRM, they canceled it that month and that was the end of it. And so it's uh, not only growing in technology, but it's growing in business process. Like we have to adapt to new technology from a technology side, but also from a business process side. And you can find that uh, fine balance that'll work for your company, I think. Mr. Yeah, I, I agree it can be a problem, um, but the fact is that any decent finance department is already dealing with this sort of regular OPEX problem outside of IT. I mean, they're dealing with, with cell phone expenses, they're dealing with regular expenses, they're dealing with a, a broad variety of contractor type systems where they already have OPEX. So it's, I think it's more of an awareness issue. You need to work with your finance folks ahead of time so they're expecting these new bills can be doing appropriate monitoring and, you know, alerting as appropriate. Um, there are some services coming online now, incidentally also OpEx, that let you do monitoring of these sorts of things and proactively alert you when you hit certain thresholds. Sir. Um, actually, it, that speaks to a broader point, I think. Um, whether, and it's a bad word I know, but whether you're thinking private cloud or public cloud, um, it's, gonna, it, it's gonna involve organizational change. Um, how you, your processes and how you do things, it's, you, have, you do have to reevaluate that. You can't, like, just like you can't just take any old app and throw it in the cloud, you can't remain a traditional IT structure organizationally and, and just go to the cloud. Things are gonna change. And I think the counterpoint is, as, a, as an IT organization, you can't not go to the cloud. You, um, may, maybe there's some, some industries or some businesses that have very tight regulatory controls or privacy controls. Um, chances are even those um, government agencies or companies may be using cloud services and may not, not realize it. But, but I think if, if your IT department, let's say in a traditional sort of company, if your IT department is no cloud services, I think that's just going to encourage people to, to move around that. And the, you know, to your point, you're still going to have finance issues, privacy issues, audit issues. Um, it, you, you need to adapt a policy that says, we think this is how it's going to work at our company, and then here are the bounds to make sure that we don't go crazy with, you know, to, your, to your point, cloud expenses. Governance, right? All right, next question. We on this side of the room? Anybody? All right. Um, my question is about information architecture. Some of you might have a problem with the same If I'm a company and I have multiple business applications that are running in multiple cloud servers, whether I need to integrate data into each of them, am I wiser to manage that myself and have some patch files and maybe I would be like a Hubble Pro broker and have all of my other cloud vendors? Or Bill, I'm going to let you answer first before you lose it over here. Go for it. This is something that we are struggling with as well. The, the, the industry is not ready yet for cloud-to-cloud -cloud communications, as far as I've been able to tell. Um, so, for instance, we have an identity provider. Our source of truth is in the cloud, in, in the public cloud. Or I'm sorry, it's a, it's a platform or it's a platform as a service. Um, and we wanted to have, we wanted to explore the idea of moving our physical access control system, our badging system, to a cloud provider. And I said, I don't want you to hairpin through my data center to go through my Active Directory. I want you to go directly to um, this provider of identity. And they said, that's exactly where we want to go in like three to five years. And we couldn't <laughs> figure out how to like effectively do cloud to cloud without being a broker. And assuming that in three to five years we figured out how to actually provide governance on this data um, or the use of this data, um, I would say for now, as far as I know, that your best bet is to, to be in the middle, to, to be the hub and spoke, um, and, and to still be the middleman for this data in between cloud services, for instance. Derek, you got some to add? Um, there are existing multi-cloud strategies and, and guidelines for do, to do exactly what you said um, that, are, that are out floating around the internet to kind of achieve that, but uh, he, he's right. There isn't really cloud-to-cloud -cloud communication right now. Is, uh, it needs more maturity. 
So, David, I, I suspect you might have an opinion on this. I have an opinion on everything. <laughs> I know you're shocked. Um, I think it, you know you, you're going to still see early on a lot of hub and spoke. I mean, increasingly you are starting to see you know a lot more web services type interactions. Uh, it, they, they tend to still be more intra-cloud rather than inter-cloud. But I think you know the general trend. I mean, there's two trends going on. One is this trend towards exposing everything as a service, either an API or a more traditional web service, um, which will enable cloud-to-cloud -cloud interactions. Um, at, but you're also seeing at the contrast, um, there's this concept that Dave McCrory came out with recently called data gravity, which you know, as you start building data in a place, you want tend to put the services that consume that data as close to it as possible for reliability, performance, speed, uh, latency issues like that. So you're gonna sort of see, you know, it's a lot easier to um, build a new service cl as close to your data as possible. Uh, in fact, that's one of the reasons you'll see like Amazon keeps adding on lots of really cool data management layer services like SQS and simple workflow service and things like that because those are the kind of things that lock you into Amazon. I mean, using them as an infrastructure as a service provider doesn't really lock you in that much. It's very, it, it's not super hard to transition from, you know, from them to a rack space to a private cloud if you have some reasonably savvy folks. But once you start integrating these services like RDS and S3 and things like that, you get really tightly tied to those providers very quickly. And what I'll encourage you to do is start using other services they have, even if a competitor has one that's theoretically better. Uh, Adam? Yeah, so just to add on to that, I would say, I mean, this is the challenge of the Internet of Things. So what I'm seeing with a lot of organizations is they, they move to the cloud and then they end up with these services and each service is made up of things. And so even if you go and you use a SaaS provider, um, you know, to sign up for your $8 a month, even that SaaS provider has other things, other SaaS providers behind it. And now from a business, you have to determine what is the risk of, you know, using all these different things and hooking these things together and moving your data, uh, not just from a security standpoint, but as you said, from competitive standpoint, stability, all of this. Um, I think, you know, to, add, to agree with what everybody else said, that the, the maturity of the vendor standards and the implementation of clouds working together is still, um, you know, on the, in the early stages. And so many companies are trying to figure out how to put these things together. And it's really, this comes down to a business decision of, can you support that integration? If the vendor changes their API, can you continue to support your code and change your code? And can you deal with the risk of moving this stuff around um, across multiple vendors that have different SLAs and it may affect your overall SLA? One of the things, so to, to add on to your question, one of, the, one of the things, or one of the dangers to avoid is thinking about cloud versus IT or cloud versus your IT team. Um, you should also, if, if you're in an IT organization, you should think about how does your IT team make a cloud service? So for instance, maybe you make identity service for the enterprise in your cloud. Maybe the cloud is public, maybe it's private, but you start thinking about how do I provide a service to other services? And so it's not this them versus us, it's, it's you participating in that model of you know, something as a service. Anybody else uh, got a next question out there? Yes, sir. So, so what were the three? OpEx versus CapEx, cloud is not secure. Clouds can't talk to each other. What's the order of importance? I guess you try to solve those in. Well, being a security guy, I'm going to pick security first. So, <laughs> if you can't if you can't secure the data, and if you if you provably can't secure the data, then I don't think the other things matter. Um, so, if you start from there, if you establish a, 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 a rational argument that says for this class of data, for these types of um, uh, processes, for instance. Um, I, I now convinced, and I can audit, and I can test that I have some, you know, level of security. Then I would think uh, I would talk about um, sort of the cloud-to-cloud -cloud service, and then cost less, uh, co cost last. Last. Okay. Derek, who who's solving the problem when you say that? If you're going to rank them, you say which problem needs to be solved. Who? So the question just got more complicated. It did. Um, Can I, I change my answer? <laughs> you can't change your answer. This is a pen. It's a really good question. 
Um, I, I would say, well, so if we're going to rank them based on what you originally asked, I w yeah, cloud security probably would be the, the first thing I, I would want to address uh, in that conversation. The cloud-to-cloud -cloud communication, they might even have thought of that yet, right? Um, so probably, and the cap, CapEx, OpEx, and, you know, whatever, they'll figure that out. I, I would say security, but the other two, a distant second and third. I have to agree with you guys. Anybody, anybody said, Adam, anything different? Um, I think it's about context of the organization. Uh, who is going to be your blocker? In IT, there's some IT organizations, they don't care about security. They care about their, do their bottom line and their dollars. Um, other ones, they care about the interoperability. Other ones, they care about the support. Uh, so I think it's, if, if you're asking the question based on the organization and what blockers you might run into and how to solve those blockers, I think it's important to understand what the values of that organization are that you're speaking to, and that's going to tell you the order which you uh, address them. Uh, if you're asking me or pretty much anybody else on the panel, it's security first, obviously. Last uh, actually, I was going to... I was going to say none of them, or a qualified none of them. Oh, interesting. Uh, um, I, to, to a certain extent, it's not the, the cloud, whether the cloud provider itself is secure or not is, is the wrong question to be asking. The question is, can you secure your data that you're putting in the cloud appropriately for your compliance governance needs? And so the things you want to be looking at are the, the most important in the context of that is, you know, is governance identity. How are you going to take your corporate identities that you use as in-house as your personal identifier for that information and ownership of that information and apply that to the cloud. And I think that's where you start getting the governance, monitoring, auditing, not so much, you know, I'm not going to have an, sit around and argue with IT people whether Rackspace is more secure than OpenStack versus Eucalyptus versus Amazon. That's the wrong question to be asking. The question is, do they enable me to do what I need to do to get my job done today? And can, can IT or can security work around uh, the different levels of insecurity in all the different vendors. Right. And, and that's true for in-house services, out-of-house services, cloud, not cloud, Can ASPs. You say out-of-house services? Those two. There are some pretty shitty services out there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well done. It's Next no question. accident that our, oh. that, you know, my team's PCI and SOC significant data and processes were the last ones to be, to, to be ranked last in terms of things we're moving to the cloud, the public cloud. So we spent a lot of time on that data and the security around those processes. Um, you know, we took 14 months to figure out how to do an HSM or like a hardware HSM um, in the cloud. And, you know, that is the foundation for a lot of our sort of next layer of security services. But that took us a long time to figure out. Meanwhile, we had more interesting or, you know, from a consumer's perspective, more interesting data. From a security perspective, the really interesting stuff, that's last to go. Okay. And we have got another question. Yes, sir. This is a question that's really both mobile and cloud. Uh-oh. Oh boy. Wow. Nobody here is going to have an opinion on that, I promise. Um, gosh, Adam, I'm, I'm going to let you go first. Go ahead, you're biased. I'm biased on this question. So uh, my company is a mobile security company. Uh, and we, we look at the security of the total mobile ecosystem, but one of the big things we look at and our primary focus is the data and how to secure applications, how to secure data transfers on that. Um, so I'm a bit biased on this question. Uh, I don't know if you want my opinion. Go for it. Okay. Um, so one of the things that we're going to release, um, we're working with OWASP right now around secure guidelines uh, for mobile applications, and we're going to release one of our internal frameworks for protecting mobile applications and mobile data, uh, because there's absolutely ways to develop mobile applications in a secure manner. Um, but the interesting thing about the mobile space is that your corporate data, especially in the BYOD space, uh, your corporate data is sitting right next to consumer data, and you don't own the device, you can't lock it down. So there's a gap in the offerings right now and kind of a lot of the solutions and thought leadership in this space because it's so new uh, and because we're still starting to, we're still finding out how secure these different mobile vendors are. And, you know, is their sandboxing really holding up or not? I don't know. Um, and so uh, I think if you, if you look at the total mobile ecosystem, you look at the total risk, and you control what can go to the device and how it's managed once it's at the device and then where it can leave from that application, uh, you can start to build a pretty good strategy. And that's about where I'm going to leave it without launching into a vendor pitch. <laughs> and we'd like to keep it that way. All right. 
Derek, anything to throw at that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Bill? I have an opinion on everything. Um, so one of the things that I I strive to do is to keep data off the devices. So, for, so I'm, I love HTML5, for instance, versus the fat applications. But I think the way that the security world is going is they're, they're trying to figure out how to do transactional security. So try to figure out what is the anomalies based on when Bill is logging into this uh, CRM application. What does he normally do and what is he doing now and where is he doing it from? And sort of building this context around the transactions. And rather than worrying about, like, I've got to encrypt this data at rest on this device and, and lock it down, worry about how does he even access any of this data from the, from the get-go. Um, so I think that's one of, the, one of the trends I see in the security industry is because the, the data is moving everywhere. It's so diffuse, it's so hard to, to grab um, and to control with traditional controls that um, I, I think the, the security controls are moving to the application side and, and the transaction layer. So David, I'm going to pose this to you. I'm going to, I'm going to change the question just a little bit because I, I seem to believe uh, that whether we're talking about mobile or whether we're talking about the cloud, it's not about the device or the environment anymore. It's about we're going back to applications and data. How are, do you see these as similar, right? The, 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 the mobile space and the cloud space, the security approaches them similar for applications deployment. I mean, disagree with me, I dare you. <laughs> Uh, they're, they're, they're completely the same. I mean, it's, it sounds like they're different. I mean, in the cloud, you have the data all consolidated onto you know, a small set of servers. On mobile, it's on every device that you can possibly think of. Um, so in some sense, it's, they're completely different. But in the end, um, like my panelists have already said, what you, you have to stop worrying about where the data is physically, what the data is physically on. It doesn't matter if it's an Amazon or on my iPad. You still care about the data. So you have to stop worrying about the device focus on the data, so which means you need to know what you have at the beginning, you need to be able, you have to have that data audited and classified in some way. And that doesn't mean like a military level, 18 layers of, of, of you know, data classification, but you may be just something as simple as um, public information, company confidential, and personal information, um, purely for the sake of if this data gets lost, do I need to, are there laws I need to comply with for notifying stockhold, you know, shareholders or you know, various government agencies? Um, track where that data goes and ideally um, have some methodology of destroying that data on the device if it gets lost. Don't worry, is this an Apple device or an Android device? Um, and essentially what, you, what this new space is being called is, you know, is, is mobile information management or MIM or as we used to call it, DRM. <laughs> um, but effectively that's the thing. I mean, even today, I mean, it's like today, um, you have the ability with a variety of software packages to wipe you know, mobile devices remotely, whether it's the entire device or in some cases at the application layer. Increasingly, it's gonna have to be at the application layer because you don't wanna necessarily destroy all of the data. You wanna destroy that one key you know, application's worth of data. Okay. Next question from the audience. Don't all raise your hands at once. We answered all of your questions. So while you're thinking, so I thought something you just said was really interesting, which is from a company perspective, my data classification policy includes something called personal information. I was thinking like company restricted, public, private, but then you added the, the personal information, which is something I hadn't considered before. That's pretty interesting. So I have a corporate owned device or a corporate sort of sanctioned device and I have personal data on there. That's, that's obvious. Right. So that's really that's really good. And that's the other thing is you don't actually care. You know, if someone calls up IT and says, my, uh, you know, my tablet was stolen, the first question that doesn't come to mind is, oh, I hope that's not a, per a corporate device or I hope that's not a personally owned device. The right. question is, um, you know, what data was on the device. And, and from yeah. personal data, there's, I mean, there's actually, there's actually two schemes of personal data there that, that you sort of highlight. I mean, there's the data, my personal data, like I have my MP3s or my personal videos and the pictures of my kids that are on my phone. All your but, Britney Spears videos? Yeah, you know I like her. But there's also, you know, customers' personal information like credit card number, PCI data, HIPAA data, things like that that have very specific implications, um, you know, liability concerns to the company as a whole. I gotta be honest though, if the apps that you, if you're getting, if you're worrying about your credit card data being stored on your local tablet or something, uh, the vendors that, that gave you those applications have done something horribly wrong, right? Well, it depends. So what if you're using a payment application? There's a variety of payment applications mm -hmm. that are being used at restaurants, and the cash registers are essentially um, iPads with a, with, with a square reader or one of their competitors on. I mean, or, it's a, or it's actually is a, it's a laptop with a cash register. I mean, that's a 
that's a mobile device. It's a laptop. It's you know, it, and so I mean, there are a lot of reasons to say why the hell was that data there. But you know, it could also be you know, uh, you're a sales rep, so you have um, you know the co the contact information, which includes people's cell phone numbers in some place in some states and some countries. That counts as PII, um, just because you have their account number, their home con their phone number, their full name, and the last four digits of their SSN, which mm -hmm. in and of itself isn't necessarily unreasonable for, well actually the SSN is, but the rest of it isn't unreasonable information for someone to have as they're walking around, but you know, if I get that and I, ha you know, if I steal someone's laptop and it happens to have, you know, um, ComEd's, you know, account records on there, I could call them and pretend to be you and have your power shut off. And you'd but probably you be unhappy about that. I hope you wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that, no. If the IT department told you to put a pin on your phone to protect it and it was a company phone with just company data, you'd probably think, oh, big IT is trying to like, you know, put the hammer down on me. But if that same phone had your kids' pictures on there and some, and also had it had oh, happened to have some company data on there, you probably would think twice. Like, yeah, maybe I should put a pin on this because I'm worried about my kids' data. And also probably think a lot more often. Yeah. But that's besides the point. <laughs> yeah. Win. Anybody else questions? I've got one for them. If you guys don't have anything. Uh oh. Yes, sir. Anybody want yeah. to take that? Yeah, sure. I, I'll take that. Um, so, <clears throat> two two things. First, um, it's about a skill set change, right? You're not going to suddenly not need uh, people, IT people. You, it's that their skills are going to have to evolve and change. Um, so, you know, that's really key right there, actually, because developing applications for the cloud is a skill, I and mean, there's a, it's a practice. There's a practice around that. At this point, there's multiple mailing lists, multiple forums. Uh, you know, people who are experts in that. I mean, it's like a whole thing by itself now. Um, and that's just the application part. Um, the second thing is, uh, it's inevitable with any, you know, technology change. It's like, I mean, how many people have COBOL programmers still? Don't answer it. Some of you probably do. Some people do have still have COBOL programmers. But the truth is there's a lot less of them, right? Um, as skill sets turn over, some people go away, you, you bring new people on. And with IT, because technology tends to cannibal, cannibalize itself, hopefully when it's turning over, there are actually fewer people doing more through automations and better tools than what you previously had to do. Um, actually, I forgot my second point, but that was it. <laughs> so, <laughs> how many of you have ever been in IT department and said, I have enough staff? I don't see any hands going up. Yeah. I mean, how many times have you said, man, my IT staff doesn't have enough to do? N these are phrases that have never been uttered by a CIO ever, ever in any company in the history of the world. <laughs> and the, so what cloud does is it, it, it removes a lot of the grunt work of IT. It allows you to automate things. It enables you to move faster, which lets your IT folks concentrate on the huge backlog of projects and things that need doing. So I'm going to wrap, I'm going to, as we get to the end of this, I'm going to ask you guys an interesting question. Because we've, we've heard uh, people recently talk about the fact that as we continue to virtualize, as we, as we continue to abstract, we tend to make things, um, well, more abstract and easier, right? You, you're, when you create, when you're in the, uh, when you have, you know, you've got an Amazon instance, and you want to create rules of communication between zones or between instances, it's not open TCP IP port 25, right? It, you're allowing from instance to, you're abstracting that. Now we've got tools that allow us to make the changes, something easier to understand, right? It, it's, it's kind of a, it takes us away from the deep technology and the automation takes care of that tech. Yep. Does this make us more or less secure, guys? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it changes the mechanics of how you do security, but it doesn't change, so you talk about abstraction, I don't think it changes the focus. It doesn't change what you're trying to accomplish. So like you said, you know, I'm, I'm applying an ACL to a host, 
and now you know, in, the, in the new world, I'm tagging a host, and when it launches, it's part of a security group, and it has these inherent properties. I still need to set controls, audit controls, review controls, test controls. It's just done differently. So does it make it more or less secure? I, I think that's partly just based on the evolution of the controls themselves. So, you know, like firewall ACLs, they still suck. Um, they're hard to do. And suddenly we've got a completely different way of doing them with security groups, for instance, with Amazon instances. And I know there's, there's other cloud providers that have similar sort of metaphors. Um, you still need to like do the work, if, whether you automate it or not, and then you need to test it and audit it. So I don't think it really moves the needle on more versus less. Okay, David. It, 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 well, it's really a, a squeezing the balloon kind of kind of problem. I mean, to, to abuse, over abuse uh, a dead over horse. Abuse. Um, that so, for instance, you know, when you migrate from you know a data center you own to Amazon, you've just eliminated all the physical security work. You don't do physical security anymore. You don't worry about who has access. You don't worry about monitoring. You don't worry about auditing those physical services because Amazon's dealing with that for you. In exchange, you have a whole set, you know, a whole group of special credentials that you need to protect. Because if you, if you lose those credentials, they don't just control one of your devices, they control every, every device. Yeah. And so you're, you're, you're moving your target and what, you, what needs protecting and how it needs to be protected. But your security hasn't, as, as Bill said, hasn't fundamentally changed. You just need to understand what you get and what you don't get. And so you're protecting the right things. Either of you guys got anything else to add? No, I mean, I think that's exactly it. I mean, you're just, you're moving risk. Um, you know, as we evolve, our risks change and they move in different places. And so you have new places to focus and you have new uh, process implement. Um, you know, in the 80s, we didn't worry about SQL injection. Now we do. I mean, we, things change, we evolve, and that's just part of the business. Um, that, I think that's an interesting question because there's a, in spite of that, with the, your layers of abstraction, if you're not aware of what layers are being abstracted, right, because you're just interfacing with the top level service, um, that can actually, that can be problematic for some organizations that want a chain of custody for their data. Like if you go to a provider and they do some piece of the cloud solution, but then in turn they're using another cloud provider for storage or some other piece of the cloud solution, um, and you're not aware of that, or you know, that, how can you test that? How, how can you be certain um, that that chain of custody is accounted for when there's an incident? And that's, well, I guess maybe I'm answering my own question. That's something you have to know. You have to understand when you're looking to deploy cloud services. All right. So I'm going to ask one, one last question to close this off. And you all get, every one of you guys gets about 30 seconds worth to answer. Uh, sure. The biggest challenge to, to implementing migrating from our current infrastructure sort of on-premise based uh, legacy, I will call it legacy IT at this point, to a cloud elastic, agile based business. The number one biggest risk or number one biggest obstacle, Bill. Visibility into audits. That didn't take 30 seconds. David? Uh, I, well, two things actually. One is just application architecture. Um, if you don't have the right architecture, doesn't you're not going to get anything out of moving to the cloud. And on a similar vein, it's you know you need the audit you need the audit monitoring perspective. Adam, uh, understanding the things that make up that service so that you can fully understand the risk and then move into the audit side of it. Last word, uh, the word cloud. <laughs> it's like uh, um, we have to get away from that word because just the title of this presentation, yeah. the cloud is not secure. If you yes have, and no. Right. Well, at the same time, it's like if you had a friend who's never eaten at a restaurant and you want to take them somewhere and they stop and they ask, well, I don't know, are restaurants safe? How do you answer that? There's so many things can go wrong on your way to the restaurant, at the restaurant, on the way back that could make them believe restaurants are not safe. It's not a reasonable question. Well, on that note, thank you. <laughs> I don't know a better way to close off this panel than with that last word. So um, join me in t saying thanks to you guys uh, up, on the, up on the panel here. Thanks to you guys for asking the questions. Hopefully you got something out of it. This is a wrap. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.